All right, let's pray for Damien. It's going to be a great day. Lord, thanks for this morning, the chance to gather, chance to be with the brothers and so many things uh, to pray about today, but also to be thankful for. And so, Lord, we just place our life in your hands. We pray your will will be done. And, Lord, you'll use this talk for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, I, honestly, I've never actually never got a clap before, so I was impressed. <laughs> I said, wow, someone really loves me out there. Hey, thank you, Luke. Good morning, man. How y'all doing? Well, before we get started here, I want to just take a quick second just to give a quick synopsis of what's happening February 17th. So for the last five months, my team has been in this total transformation with God. And we actually stopped doing shows in the beginning of September. The Lord pressed on my heart to not take any shows, to really focus on the football team on North and really see that every single Friday and do all the way through the playoffs. And I told my team, say, hey, I won't be available for any of the shows this fall. One of my other team members said, you know what, I, I agree. And so I encourage my other team members to say, I want you to pray. What is the Lord asking you? And through that, we all came in agreement and said, hey, we're not going to do any shows for the fall. I mean, we turned out shows from North Carolina, from Denver, all those across the country, which has been really cool and awesome. But God met us. And one of my team members got baptized. Another of my team member is now going to get his minister alliance, uh, minister alliance. And so that was just like so beautiful within that. And so then now in January, we sat down saying, okay, when is God calling us to get back on the stage? And we said, you know what, it's, the time is now. And so we actually said, you know, Pastor Dylan at King's Church, he's been beautiful, he's been awesome, uh, just loves the mission and vision of what we're doing. And so he goes, hey, just come to my church, we'll open the doors, and we want to partner with you. Just bring a show to Lee Summit. And so we're like, all right, awesome. And so we're actually going to do a free show for not only teenagers, but young adults and adults. So you guys are invited as well. Um, your families are invited. And one thing that most people think, like, is, yes, we do a lot of it towards youth and young adults, but... We want you to see it, too, because we want you to see what God's been doing in us and what we truly are about. We're not just a rap concert. We're more than a show. We're a ministry. We are a worship team, and that's what it really is. February 17th, 17th. So if you want to be around a lot of teenagers, though, because we got people from St. Louis, Springfield, Kansas, Nebraska, they're bringing their youth groups from down here to Kansas City to see us, which is awesome. But it's a good opportunity for you to serve, to minister, to engage. And so we need some security. We need some parking people to help with the parking and everything. We need some people to help with hot dogs, all that. So, again, Rod has that sign-up sheet, and I would love. We're looking about 15 volunteers, and so I see about 90 men in here. So I'm like, I got to get 15 in here, but I know you guys' heart. And if you want to pour into the next generation, that's a great opportunity to do that. Well, men, let's get right into the message here, and I don't want to take too much time with that. But this morning I was on YouTube, and I just sometimes I find myself just lingering just just checking out some videos, whether that's a sermon, whether that's a prayer, whether that's a worship video. And I, I came across this video about being still. My word of the year this year is rest. And what I mean about rest is not me just sleeping and being lazy, but for me to really focus on going into the secret place where God is meeting me and he's teaching me, he's guiding me, he's leading me, and he's showing me. And what he told me was, he said, Dave, you're going to have many big events coming up this year, but you need to focus on truly what rest is. Can you rest and be with your family at the same time? Can you rest and speak at the same time? Can you rest and serve at the same time? And Matthew 11, 20, 30 is an invitation of God's rest and co-laborship. And in Isaiah 58, 11, which is so powerful, it says, I, the Lord of God, continue to lead you, and then he will give you water when you run dry, restoring your strength. And then you'll be like a well-watered garden, like an everlasting spring. And that itself, that picture being a well-watered garden and an everlasting spring. And it came across this video this morning. It says, Psalm 46, 10 says, be still and know that I am God. This is not even part of my notes, but this is an encouragement to you. Be still and know that I am God. And what he means about being still He's talking about, don't worry about all the things that's going on in your life. Stop worrying. Stop panicking. Stop complaining. And just focus your attention onto me. Just be still and know that I am God. 
So boldness, boldness is the willingness to take risk, to act innovative, to be confident, and to have courage. Boldness. And God has called us men to be bold. He's called us to be bold, man. When was the last time you was bold in your faith? Really think about that. When was the last time you had to be bold about your faith? About your marriage? About your children? About your ministry? In a conversation? In a decision? Were you bold? A couple months ago, I had a good opportunity. I was invited by a student to have a coffee with, and she reached out to the teacher and said, hey, can you give me Damien's cell phone number? Because I know he's one of our mentors in class, but I just want to get closer to Jesus, and I know Damien can help me get closer to Jesus. And she sent me this long text of saying, hey, uh, I, I know you don't know who this is, but I just want to let you know I'm in your class, and I want you to understand that I want to get closer to Jesus, and the only person I can think of was you. So can you meet me for coffee? We can we have a conversation about that? And the very next week, we went, sat down, and had a conversation, and I already knew with some of the stuff. I knew who she was. I mean, there's only 13 students in the whole entire class, but yet this senior was sitting in this room with me at Coburn Library. And as people are walking by, and as I'm listening and engaging with this young woman here, the spirit pressed in my heart, and he goes, "You must be bold in this moment." And I had to remove myself and say, I can't worry about my nervousness. I can't worry about what offense will take. I cannot worry about what she will say, the expressions that will give. And I looked her right in then her eye and said, you're not a lesbian, but you're a daughter of the living king. You're not a lesbian. A lesbian is a thought. It's not a being. And she goes, you really think that? And then I just took her into the Bible and I just shared scripture with her saying, you are chosen, you are redeemed, you are forgiven. And she shared her story with me. And I told her all those that things in the past between your parents' divorce, all the stuff in the brokenness of relationships, those are not your fault. But what you have done was I had to find a place so I can be accepted in, I can feel loved in. And the thing that you felt like you could be loved in the most was the thing you actually distanced yourself from was the church. She was hurt from the church. She was hurt from her parents. And she walked out of that room saying, Jesus is my Lord. She gave her life to Jesus. She transformed her mind, which was Romans 12, 2. And 2 Corinthians 5, 17 was displayed right in my face that she left the past and stepped into the new and what's even more beautiful the very next week her best friend gave his life to jesus on the phone with me there's something going on with my friend here and i must ask what is going on and i've been meeting with him for several weeks we just got done doing a devotional together and i looked them in the eye and i said you need to stop what you're doing i know what you're doing behind closed doors God is offended on that. He goes, how can I change this? So we got into the Bible app and we got into a message and we started talking about what it really means to cultivate healthy relationships. That's boldness, man. And what's beautiful in that act of boldness, it wasn't the crazy thing, the fact of man, the courage behind it, but you must recognize the effect of what godly boldness is. So who are people in the Bible that are bold? The first one I can think of is Peter. And we know Peter and Peter's and he's just one of those guys is like, I can tell he's in my friend group and I'm like, he's a knucklehead. He'll do some crazy stuff. He'll say some powerful stuff and he will do some things like you are just off the wall. But Peter himself in Matthew 14, 27 to 29, this isn't a message version because I just love what it says. But Jesus was quick to comfort them. Take courage, it's me. Don't be afraid. And Peter, suddenly bold, said, Master, if it's really you, call me to come to you on the water. And he said, come ahead. And jumping out the boat, Peter walked on the water to Jesus. Peter walked. 
on the water to Jesus. If I was in the boat and I'm sitting there with Peter, and I love the scripture says, Peter's suddenly bold. So I was like, bro, you have not been bold this whole entire time. And all of a sudden now you want to be bold. You was just afraid that as I, what I saw was a ghost out in the lake, but now you want to go out there. But the reason why he won't go out there because he knew who Jesus was. And Peter did the miracle because of the boldness act of faith. He got out the boat. And are we as bold as Peter? Are we have that same urgency of saying, man, Jesus, if that's you, call me out. Get out the boat, Damien. Get out the boat, Tom, Bobby. Get out the boat, John. And we must ask yourself, though, what is our boat, though? Is it an addiction? Is it in a relationship? Is it our business? Our own ministry? Are you bold to get out the church that's not speaking the truth of God? But, Damien, I must be committed to this church. My mom went to it. My daddy went to it. My grandpappy went to it. I've been going to this church for 40 years. But yet, has your faith been lukewarm? Have you just been comfortable with your faith? Are you in a place where God is telling you to step out and be uncomfortable, be stretched, to be challenged? You must ask yourself, am I being bold as Peter? And are you bold enough to say, I won't go back to that boat? Matter of fact, I'll poke holes in that boat and let it sink so I have no place to go but Jesus. The second man I thought about boldness is Joseph of Arimathea. Luke 23, 50 to 51 says, Now there was a man named Joseph, a member of the council, a good and upright man, who had not consented to the decision and action. He came from the Judean town of Arimathea, and he himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. See, what was beautiful about Joseph, what was powerful about Joseph, Joseph was part of the government. He was part of the council itself. And he had this meaning of what they're going to do with Jesus. And Joseph really had to walk across this floor, really walk across in front of all his peers, in front of all his associates to cast this vote saying, what you're doing is wrong. I won't take no part of it. And what people fail to realize is when you are bold, you will stand out. You will stand out when you are bold. And do you have the boldness to say no? And it takes boldness to say no. Put your phone down. No. I need to be in my word. I need to focus on it right now. Is there a relationship that you're fiddling with right now? Will you say no? See, not only bo Joseph was bold, it was even more so how he did it. Joseph Arimathea, a prominent member of the council who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Who's bold enough in this room right now that can say, 2,000 years ago when Jesus actually passed away and you're in that time right now and saying, where's the superstars that of the disciples? Where's Thomas? Where's Andrew? Where's Peter? Where's all these guys that no one wanted to come out to the open to claim the body of Jesus? But Joseph of Arimathea, a good upright man, said, you know what? I'm going to be bold and go up to Pilate and ask for the body of Jesus because he deserves a proper burial. The reason why Jesus was buried in the tomb is because of a man's act of boldness. Not because it was ceremonial, because of the act of boldness. Think about that. Powerful. Amazing. The faithfulness, the boldness of these two men. And the last man I want to talk about is Daniel. We know the story of Daniel. In Daniel 6, we find Daniel was a man with no corruption, and he had trust and worked from the king himself. The king loved Daniel. 
But the administrators of the government cannot stand Daniel. So what they do, they say, we got to figure out a way to mess up Daniel a little bit. To, we got to figure out a way to accuse him with something. Do you know what they did? They went to the king himself. And he said, you know what, king? And they just swayed him. They talked good to the king. Right? And I can see the king right now saying, you know, they're saying, king, you're so amazing. King, you're so awesome. And I can see the king saying, no, stop. No, please stop. Please, more. No, please stop. More. King, you're amazing. King, you're awesome. Better yet, king, no one should worship any other god but you. You're Everyone should worship you and pray over you for the next 30 days. We should make that a law. And King said, you know what? He was so caught up in his pride. He goes, man, just sign the paper. I'm going to go ahead and sign the paper for you. And for the next 30 days, no one in that time could not actually pray to any other gods but the king himself. And they did. They would be thrown in the pit of lions. But what would Daniel do? Daniel went back to his room where the windows were open face towards Jerusalem, and he prayed three times. He was consistent with his faith. He was bold with his faith. He didn't care what would happen to him. And what was even beautiful more than that is when he even got thrown into the pit, what happened to him? Nothing. Because of the boldness act he had towards his father and to the men. See, he knew God was a priority in his life. He let boldness take over fear. And there's been moments in our life, even yesterday, possibly, you're saying, ooh, I don't know about this. And you let fear trickle in. And all it needs is just a little crack. Fear just needs a little crack. And it just turns into this huge thing. Will you let boldness take over fear? Will you let boldness take over fear? Are you willing to be bold enough when it gets to the point when it is a law? And can you stand up for what is right? What do you think we're being persecuted now? Oh, the persecution ain't happening right now. We can still go to church. We can still wake up in the morning at 6 o'clock, eat some Panera, get our coffee, sing hallelujah to Jesus, get a good word in and not be persecuted at all and go back to work and live our lives. There will be a time, though, that there will be a law. There will be a moment that you can't set Jesus out in the law that you literally will get in trouble yet killed itself. Will you be bold in that moment? But if it's your time and the season and the generation of God is here, Will you be bold to stand up for what's right? Will you be bold? Will you let limitations limit your faith and obedience to God? Are there limitations that has limited your faith and obedience to God? If so, write those down. Ask the brother next to you, how can I keep from this limitation away from me so I can walk in fullness obedience to God? So why is it important to be bold in your faith? I'm giving you a homework assignment. I'm not going to read this whole passage to you, right? I'm going to tell you just like I told my athletes, I tell the students that I get to engage with, I trust you. Your men in here, your leaders. So if you're a leader, you do what's right. Spend some time in God's word. Because if you're here this morning, you don't spend time in God's word. I challenge you to start reading it. Man. Acts 4, 13 to 31 says this, man. It's Here's a synopsis of it. Check how bold Peter and John was. They were standing before the Sanhedrin. They were thrown in jail, and they proclaimed the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And these men saw how bold and courageous these men were. Ordinary men. Just ordinary men. Just bold and courageous proclaiming the truth and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Others started to follow Jesus. People were being filled with the spirit. The power of God was being glorified and being displayed through healings and signs and wonders. God, I haven't seen a sign. God, I haven't seen a wonder. God, I haven't seen a healing for years, for decades. Are you walking in the power of God? Are you seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness? Are you spending time with them? In Acts 4.31, the last verse of your homework assignment says, After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word boldly. They spoke the word of God boldly. 
boldly. So there's some lessons to look for within these 17 verses that you're looking at, whether that's later today, that's tonight, that's two days from now, this weekend. I challenge you to do it before next Wednesday. And I challenge you to even write some notes down. Send my email. Some of you got my email on the notes. Send an email to you. I would love to hear. I'm curious. I'm always learning. I always just want to see what other men are thinking, what revelation God is giving you. But here are some lessons to look for within that text. The power of boldness. The boldness that comes with the Holy Spirit and speak with boldness. And I just want to look at number two real quick. The boldness that comes with the Holy Spirit. Man, it really starts with number one, though. It's because literally the power, just like these lights are on, it's because of power. Just like your appliance at home, your phone that you have, it's only working because of the power source. And the Holy Spirit is our power source that ignites us, that gets us going and leads us and guides us and moves us, corrects us, convicts us. It's the power source to be bold. So I want to spend this last 10 to 12 minutes here on some powerful things that God wants us men to live by. I finished this boldness devotional called Bold Leaders. It's just bold leaders. You can find it in your version app, seven-day plan. It's a powerful, powerful plan. And I said, man, I have to use some of this content. Not, not most of this content, just, just the points at least. So, because it goes right into what I'm preaching and speaking about. And man, men with boldness holds and cultivates these specific characteristics. The first one is this, vision casting. Vision casting. Do you have a vision right now? What is your vision for 2023? Personally, as a family, as a ministry, as a business, part of that vision will be your one word. That one word that God has given you is part of the vision that you have for this year. What's that really look like? Vision drives boldness. Vision stirs the confidence of boldness. I sat in a room with a bunch of leaders. And they're complaining, and there's all these things going on, but yet there was no vision. There was no vision. And I just walked out and just heartbroken. Because then we spent an hour talking about, man, we can't do this, we can't do that, rather than, where are we going? Where is God leading us to? What does he want us to do in our life? So have vision. What is your mission statement, your vision statement that Rod challenges us with every year? Mine is to reach the one with God's love, with risk-taking, and being culturally relatable to those that feel like they can't be touched. And it goes right into the ministry that I do. That one-on-one -on -one ministry that turns into the crowds. The second one is compelled to action. Compelled to action. And this means right here, do you have the urgency to do something to make a difference? Do you have the passion? I'm a very passionate guy, as you may know. But yet, do you have the urgency and I mean the urgency, the urge to go and do something about it. And when you're reading God's word and it says go and make disciples, that is an urgency. And it says to all nations. So that means our neighborhood, to means to our job, to means to Idaho, to means to Africa. I mean, literally to all the nations. Do you have the urgency? Where is God sending you? Are you compelled to actually going and doing something? There's a unique story where I was in a discipleship program for 58 days. It was very intensive in 2015. This is where God turned the corner from my identity from being a soccer player to truly being a man of God. And I was with my team in Haiti. We had to live like a Haitian. We had to understand what a Haitian. And in the last 10 days, we literally had to be in the villages and ministering and evangelizing. And one morning, for me, I said, Lord, challenge me, stretch me. And we're walking down this village. And all of a sudden, my team went right and I went left. 
and I had Patrick and I had Pinyol right next to me. All my team was that way, and I was the only American going to this other village. In that moment, I could be fearful. I could have been stressed out. I could have been scared, but I let boldness take over. Because in that moment, I remember that they had to take me to a separate room and saying, David, before you actually step in Haiti, you must understand something. Yes, some of them may think you're Haitian, but yet when you step over there, because you have earrings, because you have dreadlocks, they will think you're a gang member. And so as they think you're a gang member, you're already putting yourself in this predicament that you may have some things that will come up at you. So I'm thinking about all these things in my mind, but no, what I was thinking was, who can hear the gospel? And I'm walking down the street, and all of a sudden I find myself standing in this corner of the street, and there's about 40, 50 Haitians here just listening to the gospel. And there's one man that had seven wives and several children. I mean, I cannot make this up. He goes, can Jesus save me? And I said, absolutely, sir. And I prayed over him, and I literally prayed Romans 12, 2 over his life that God will renew and transform him. And he took off the dead sprint saying, glory, 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 God almighty. That's what he was saying, and that's what Pena was translating to me. He says, you must give your life to Jesus. You must give your life to Jesus. Jesus just saved me. Jesus just saved me. He's the king. And then I walk down the street even more. And when you talk about when you see the first act of faith happen, when God actually stirs in the heart, it just makes you even more passionate and even more urgency. So then I'm walking down the street and then here comes this young girl that her mom was a witchcraft doctor. And she goes, I want to give my life to Jesus, but I'm afraid that my mom would have seen demons. I said, those demons have nothing against what Jesus has. Jesus has the power. And she goes, I'm going to give my life to Jesus. And then she was walking down and saying, God's going to do something in my life. And then I walked to these, all these construction workers and I said, talking about telling them to stop working. I said, Patrick, tell them to stop working to come down and hear the truth. And these actual construction workers come down and this young man that had no shoes, he was filled with concrete dust. And he goes, I don't know if I can be saved by Jesus. I said, why, son? He goes, I don't have no shoes. I have no church clothes. So Jesus doesn't love me. I said, no, Jesus can meet you right here, right now. We're having church. And Jesus loves you so much, son, that he's going to take his loving arms and take you home. He starts crying. He receives Jesus Christ. And I got back to my team. My team looked wiped out and I was full of energy because I just saw the glory of God fall down because of the act of boldness. I would never forget that. that was one of my favorite memories and I can't wait and I hope when we get to heaven you can just look at some snapshots in your life of something that faith actually did and I want to look back in that moment and all the people that gave a life to Jesus in that moment it was so powerful. Stop sitting around. Have urgency. Living in conviction is the next one. Living in conviction. Convictions are safeguards in our lives to not fall into temptations. Conviction keeps us from falling into traps. Are you bold enough to live under conviction? Two weeks ago, we had Derek Rod's son here, and he spoke so powerfully about confessing. And the reason why he's able to confess every single Monday because he lives under the power of conviction. And if you truly live in the power of conviction, you will have something to confess. Because Romans 6 reminds us that we all fall short of the glory of God. But what's powerful, that God gives us grace. Next one is contentment that brings fulfillment. Contentment that brings fulfillment. Are you content where God has you right now? And this is the season God's really challenged me right now with the word rest. Because I know God's going to see me here. He's going to see me here. And that's not about who Damien is. It's about what God is doing in Damien. But God says, Damien, I need you to learn even more so of who you are through me and who you are in me. And so before you stand in front of other people and other crowds and aud audiences, I need you to understand who you are fully and what who I am. And But the thing is, what's so beautiful is, as a 23-year-old man, I said, man, God, I just want to know. If this is where you want me to be at in Lee Summit, I'm okay with that. You just want me to be at least some in North? I'm okay with that. You want me just to be at TJW? I'm okay with that. And stop asking for a promotion, God to elevate you, and God to literally take you somewhere else when you can be bold right where you are. Oh, God, I, I need a stage with 50,000 people. God, I need to go to Texas. God, I need to go to this next job. God, promote me as CEO. Then I can change rules. Be bold right now where you're at. Why would God promote you, elevate you, and take you somewhere else, and you can't be faithful with the little you have right now? Expand my territory. Focus on the territory you have right now. Be bold in that. The last three is this, communicating kingdom culture. If we can't 
communicate the kingdom of God with boldness and confidence. No one will know about Jesus in the place you are in. Does people know that you are a follower of Jesus at your workplace? Does people in your neighborhood, your neighbors, do they know that you are a follower of Jesus Christ? Are you communicating the gospel, the truth? Mike Bailey, he, he's actually at um, up north. Actually, he's in Overland Park. But what's beautiful with him is that he sat down with me and talked about communicating and what communication skills are and what people communicate as a speaker. And you can have this whole topic, but I communicate anything what your title is. But yet, as we have the gospel right in front of us, it's plain and simple and mysterious and powerful. And right there in the text is all the words you need for someone to come to know who Jesus Christ is. Are you communicating the kingdom culture? The next one is confronting mediocrity. Confronting mediocrity. Are you bold enough to go against what everyone else is doing? And there's this image of the bold fish. How many of you seen the bold fish image before? That all the fish is swimming one way. And then you got that one Peter fish that is one this way. Going against the current, going against the fish. But yet, what is so powerful is the fact that that fish was able to stand out. And even more so behind that is saying, do you challenge the norm? Can you challenge the norm in 2023 with your family? Will you challenge the norm with your ministry? Will you challenge the norm with your business? This is the year that God's going to change and shift me. The way we communicate, the way we do things, the way we, how we go about things, how we serve, will you challenge the norm? Are you the bullfish today? Right, yes or no? Am I the bullfish today? Yes or no? If it's no, ask yourself, how can I get there? Surround yourself with men on these tables. How can we get there together? And the last one is consistent faithfulness. One of the biggest values of our God holds to his children and his faithfulness and promises. I've known men that haven't been faithful to their spouses, to their children, to their ministries. I have known men that have been faithful to their spouses and to their children and to their ministries and where God has taken them. Are you a man of faithfulness? Are you a faithful man what God has given you? And as I look at my son that's turning six months this month, and I declare words over him. And I look at my four-year-old daughter, my three-year-old daughter, and my children. I want them to grow up and say, Daddy is a faithful man. Daddy teaches me about Jesus. Daddy serves me like Jesus. Daddy just walks like Jesus. He's a faithful man of God. I want my wife to follow up more with Jesus every time she sees me because of my faithfulness to God. Today, January 11th of 2023, I challenge you today, men, to be bold. Write down, January 11th, 2023, today, God is asking me to be bold. And then you must ask yourself, a year from now, 10 years from now, come back to the date. Did you answer the call? I know boldness is not a norm in a people trade. But if you're not bold enough to fail, you're not bold enough to finish. If you're not bold enough to fail, you're not bold enough to finish. You must ask yourself, if I step out, yeah, this business plan may not work. And many of you are business people in here. Trust me, you're like, I don't know if this will work, but I'm going to do it. And you're bold enough because now you're successful. But in your faith, are you bold enough saying, I may want to say Jesus right now in this store, but I may get turned down. Okay. But are you bold enough to fail? Because if you are, I did not know you're bold enough to finish. Take that step of faith. Boldness opens doors. Boldness creates new relationships. Boldness gives you opportunities. Boldness invites you into God's love. Let's be bold men. And watch how our homes, watch how our marriages, watch how our children, watch how our churches and our communities are transformed. Because us men in this room desire and long to be bold. And I love y'all. I truly, truly do. And I pray that today will inspire you and give you a fire or urgency to do something. No more sitting around. That's my challenge to you. 
whether that's serving on February 17th, whether that's going to a food pantry, whether it's stepping up in a role in your church, whether it's stepping up in your family, in your marriage, and be the spiritual leader. Be bold. Some of you may not go to your workplace and say, you know what, enough is enough. I got to find a new position. I got to find a new job because if you don't want me to proclaim Jesus, I can't be here. Let's pray, man. Father, thank you so much for this morning. And pray, I pray, God, that, Lord, you would just move in this moment. God, I just fill my heart. And, man, if you can stand up, I just feel like I just need to commission you in boldness right now. And so, man, if you all can stand up with me right now in this moment, I say, God, like you just interrupted prayer. I sure did. Sorry, God. Sorry, God. But I truly do. If you truly believe that you want to walk in boldness, you want to step into boldness, I want you to raise your hand. I want you to engage and ask the Lord into your own heart. And as I pray and commission prayer over you, I want you to pray in your own heart, in your own spirit. God, will you ignite a fire? God, give me the boldness, whether that's in my workplace, in my marriage, whatever that ever looks like. So as you guys go into prayer, I'm going to commission you. Father God, right now in this moment, Lord, I commission these men in the power of God to walk in boldness, Jesus, by your power and by your grace alone. Lord Jesus, I pray that these men, as they step from this place, as they enter to their homes, enter to their workplaces, enter to their ministries, their business, whatever it is, God, I pray that the boldness, their urgency in their hearts were stir so hot, so contagious, God. Lord, I pray, Father God, for direction and clarity and vision. I pray, Father God, for peace and comfort for some men today. I pray, God, Father God, that you will give them the courageous effort, God, to go out in their communities to see God move in their life and their loved ones. And God, today, I pray, Father God, for their families right now. I pray for their children in the name of Jesus, that their children will recognize something in their fathers today. Their children, their wives will recognize something in their fathers today and in their grandfathers today and their uncles today and their brothers today. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would have your way in the hearts and the minds of these men. And God, I ask that you will send them out now, Father God, wherever the places are go, that you will send them out and they will walk in fullness of boldness in your way, Jesus. Move mountains with seas. Let miracles and signs and wonders, Lord, I pray that you will have your way. So now go, men, and walk in that act of faith, a bonus, and courage. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, men. Have a nice day.